Craig, I'm sorry, it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. Hello and welcome to another Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record. Joining me this week are John Ferguson, who's the political editor with the Sunday Mail, and Ben Borland, who's the editor of the Scottish Daily Express. So, Hamza Yousaf's time as First Minister is underway, and it's not been the easiest of starts. It's been dominated by a police investigation into how SNP finances uh, were pretty much run when Nicola Sturgeon was in charge. And then, of course, we had our husband, Peter Murrell, who was arrested and then released without charge in relation to that investigation. Uh, Peter Murrell was chief executive at the time of the SNP. So there have been a sort of barrage of revelations since then. Uh, a motor home has been seized. There was a story in the Sunday Mail that Nicholas Str- Nicola Sturgeon was trying to keep a lid on scrutiny. And we also found out that uh, Hamza Youssef wasn't told for about six months that uh, SNP auditors had walked away. So let's kick off. Um, John, I mean, Hamza's only been in for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's already been a bit of a nightmare for him. Do you think that he's always going to be on the back foot while this police investigation is going on? Yeah, I think he is. And I think one of the reasons or a big reason that that's going to be really tough for him seems to be that he has a lot of loyalty to Nicola Sturgeon and to Peter Murrell as well, who he's previously called a winner. Um, and, you know, I think that if I was advising him, I would be saying that you need to put as much distance between that um, that old leadership and yourself as possible. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite surprised that he hasn't suspended Peter Murrell from the party. I'm quite surprised that he's driving forward with very unpopular Nicola Sturgeon era policies because this really is turning into a huge crisis for the for the SNP, you can't imagine a worse week in the job than to um, come in and find out. It was, it's done an interview today where he said that he wasn't told about this motorhome until after becoming first minister. They find out that the auditors have resigned six months ago and, are, and nobody else appears to be able to have found to, to, um, to sign off the accounts. You've got a very wide-ranging police investigation. He's alluded to uh, items both that the police are looking to seize uh, through warrants and items that have been seized over and above the the mysterious camper van. So it's it's difficult to imagine a worse crisis, and it's certainly going to get worse, deepen, um, go off in all different directions, and. Hamza appears to be quite determined not to to cut adrift the people who are at the centre of this. And so I think that that is going to mean that it's going to be a very difficult time for him personally. So do you think it makes sense then for Hamza to effectively chuck Nicola Sturgeon um, and Peter Murrell under the, the camper van, so to speak, John? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think that Hamza isn't naturally a ruthless person uh, would be in, I would be interested to see what Nicola Sturgeon would do if after becoming leader herself her predecessor had been found to have been involved in police investigations and things like that you know I, I don't know if she would be so loyal in fact I think we know that she she wasn't there's a, a, it doesn't seem like a sensible policy and there's also a clear precedent was set Previously, in the case of Michelle Thompson, who was suspended from the party just through association to a police investigation, Peter Murrow's been arrested. He's been interviewed by the police. There's clearly enormous questions to answer. But it's clear that the party's own national executive have been kept in the dark for years over financial dealings. It's, it's really it's quite astonishing that he's that he's not distancing himself from Peter Murrell and he's not um, he's not suspending him from party. Nicola Sturgeon said slightly more that she you know she potentially um, it's, it's still unclear exactly what her 
role has been in all of this and what she's known and when she's known. So perhaps there's more of an argument that, you know, he, he, he should be showing some loyalty to her, but I don't know if that would extend necessarily to to championing some very unpopular policies that she had. Ben, I mean, the party president, Mike Russell, has described this as the biggest crisis for the SNP in 50 years. You've got backbenchers openly being critical of positions taken by the SNP, demanding answers on financial transparency. Um, you've got the SNP sliding in the polls. Do you sense that this is a watershed moment in Scottish politics? It certainly seems that way. Um, I think the, the proof will be in the pudding when there's a by-election in Rutherglen and Hamilton West, which um, it, it looks almost certain that after the Easter recess, Margaret Ferrier's suspension of 30 days will be upheld. It'll trigger a recall petition. I can't imagine that the voters of, of South Lanarkshire will do anything other than tell her to sling a hook, which in itself will be a, a huge story. The first Scottish MP to be sacked by their constituents. But it, it, in the current context, it becomes even bigger because if Labour win that seat by a landslide, then suddenly the, the panic that we're seeing at the moment will be amplified tenfold because if Labour win Rutherglen and Hamilton West, then how you know what 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 is the electoral future for the SNP under Humza Yusuf? The, the 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 voice is calling for a complete clean break with the past and full scrutiny, shine shine some sunlight onto the accounts. Um, I think those those voters who decided to go for Humza Yusuf over Kate Forbes, or those SNP members who who went for Humza over over Forbes will start to think again. Um, and, 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 and yeah, this this is, like John said before, this is only going to go one way. It's only going to get worse. And Yeah, I mean, just like, picking up on that, Ben, I mean, you know, Kate Forbes won nearly 50% of the voting leadership contest. There is a sizable group of um, backbench critics for Hamza Yusuf to deal with. There's a lot of unhappiness amongst the members about what they're reading in the press about lack of transparency. I mean, are we heading for some sort of split, do you think, in the SNP? Ooh, good question. I mean, the, the warnings during the leadership contest were all that if Kate Forbes won, there'd be a split in the SNP. But, but actually, maybe that, that was always going to be inevitable given the, the, the current state of the party. Um, the, the, the SNP is a strange political party anyway, in that it's a kind of it's already a coalition of all different views and all different kind of political outlooks united under this one cause of independence. But Mike Russell has admitted that there, there isn't a case for independence right now. So the glue that holds the, the party together is practically dissolving before our eyes. And, and, and yes, we, we could very easily see a split. I mean, one one thing, just to go back to the earlier point, Hamza Yusuf's interview with Sky News today, I thought was fascinating. I thought there was the first sign that of frustration with Nicola Sturgeon when, when he said it would have been nice to have been told about these things. It would have been nice to know that I'm now the owner of a camper van. It would have been nice to have been... And, and it was, to, to me, it was the first time he'd expressed publicly any frustration with, with Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, where, yeah. You know, the continuity candidate is very loyal, he's very, and it's taken less than two weeks before he's already starting to to, to say, "Well, look, I wasn't told about this," and and you know if it carries on, and he then if he feels his position's at risk, who knows? I mean, uh, I think with every, with every day that goes by, he's allowing himself to be more associated with that old guard. Um, what he could have done was, as soon as this started to break, got rid of the special advisor team, get rid of all the HQ hierarchy that had anything to do with this, and to say the police will get every bit of cooperation from me. I knew nothing about it, and going forward, nothing like this 
is going to happen again. And with every day that he uh, remains loyal to that old guard, he becomes more associated with their potential misdeeds. And that, you know that it, it might be that he discovers his ruthlessness, ruthless streak when it's too late. Yes, yeah. Just, on, John, on one of the things that seems to have peeved him, the, the auditor's issue. So when this came out recently, the impression was given, maybe not by the SNP, to be fair, but the impression was that the auditors had resigned relatively recently. And then there was an event, a press event, uh, this week that I was at, and he said that, in fact, he was told um, uh, that they'd resigned around about October, which is six months ago. So the SNP managed to keep this quiet for nearly half a year. Um, it's pretty big news that auditors had walked away. What do you think this says about the SNP and their sort of attitude towards openness and transparency? Well, I mean, yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's astonishing. And the takeaway from this is that they are really struggling to find another auditor that's willing to sign off their boots. And the other big question that... Uh, you have to ask is who knew within the SNP that the auditors had resigned? Was it only Peter Murrow or did other members of the National Executive Committee know? Did Sue Ruddock know? Obviously, she's now the acting chief executive while they search for a new one. Um, it's also quite who who else knew that they had bought a camper van as a as a like you know a campaign bus that was never used as a campaign bus and appears to have sat on Peter Murrow's mum's driveway for two years unused at a time where the SNP have been so cash strapped that he's had to lend them £107,000. Um, it's, it, there's a, yeah, I mean, it raises more questions than it answers the fact that this the auditors quit six months ago and that nobody appears to have really known outside of, or I mean, the NEC haven't told us definitively, but it's unclear who has known outside of an extremely small group at the top of the party. Do you know, do you know I think, John, though, that um, if you look at all of these issues about trans lack of transparency internally in the SNP, you know, folk not knowing about the motor home, Nicola Sturgeon, as you revealed, saying to the NEC, look, finances are absolutely fine. It comes down to the fact that the SNP thought it was okay to have a husband and wife team running a political party with the obvious conflicts of interest there. You know, would she stand up to her husband? Would she question him? I mean, no other organisation would ever have such an arrangement. So I think that just with the benefit of hindsight, it was just a disgrace that that was ever allowed to happen. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right and i mean really they they themselves have ultimately been the victims of not seeing that that at the point where nicola sturgeon became the leader of the party and first minister i think peter murrow should have realized that this that there would be other things that he could do to serve the smp perhaps and but that it just wasn't a situation you could have to have the chief executive of the party as the um as the leader of the party's husband um it's and i mean i think that's ultimately where they probably wouldn't be in this situation now if they had if they'd realized that that was an unsustainable position way back in 2014. so um hamza is trying to get on the front foot and he did that yesterday or he attempted to do it by uh challenging the effective veto wielded by the UK government on their own gender recognition legislation. Basically, uh, the Scottish government is going to seek a judicial review to have this veto overturned. Now, we're not going to discuss the merits of the legislation, whether it's right or wrong, but I think it would be fair to say that it's a controversial piece of legislation. It's quite divisive, and there are elements of it that uh, do not command majority public support. So, Ben, what do you make of them going on this so early? And do you think that this is the sort of um, the, 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 the touchstone issue that uh, will turn his administration around? No, in a word. Um, 
I think if he'd if he'd gone the other way and said, as we were saying before, he, need, he needs to do something and he needs to do do it fast to distance himself from the Sturgeon era and to to have said, look, we're going to look again at the GRR, we're going to look again at some of the problems within it and, and try and sort this out in-house in Holyrood. I think that would have sent a message to say, I, I'm my own man, I'm, I'm going to do what I think is right and I'm not going to be told you know, what, what I can and can't do by, uh, by the previous administration. So, uh, no, it's, 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 a, it's completely the wrong move. He's uh, obviously during the leadership campaign, he stood by the GRR, so he was kind of obliged to follow this through. But I'm sure there was a way he could have he, he could have backed out of it. He, he's clearly trying to distract from the, the, the financial questions behind the scenes. Um, to an extent, it's worked. It's got him back on the front pages and at loggerheads with the UK government, which is where the SNP has liked to be um, strategically over the past 15 years. It's their by far their sort of favourite place to be is being seen to be sort of fighting back at UK ministers who are dictating terms to Scotland. However, this one, it, to, to me, is clearly a, a strategic mistake. 70% of the Scottish population don't back this. The, um, the economy, the health service, the, there are so many more big, important issues to people's lives than the GRR bill, he, he would have sent out a far better, far stronger message if he could have said, look, I, I'm going to consider this in due course. However, I have a list of priorities. I've listened to what the public said. Uh, the, the NHS is the number one. Uh, the economy, the, the, there are other things to be getting on with. And I'll come back to this Section 35 challenge in due course. Um, he hasn't done it. He, he's stuck to the plan that was presumably drawn up for him before before he became leader and all it's done is send out the signal that he is the continuity man it's more of the same we, we can't expect any sort of original thinking any surprise tactical moves it, 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 it's sticking to the game plan to the letter john i saw Roddy dunlop on twitter yesterday saying that it could be at least 18 months before this is resolved, and if it goes to the Supreme Court, it could be years. So, I mean, it's going to cost both governments a fortune uh, in legal bills. Um, can the Scottish government win in the long term on this issue, given that uh, many of the key provisions are unpopular amongst Scots? Yeah, I mean, I think but, so there's two questions. Can, can they win the court case? And the other question is, can are they going to ultimately win on this issue? If, if this was something that um, that the Scottish people were overwhelmingly behind, then you can kind of lose in court but still win in the court of public opinion. It seems that in this case, the public by and large don't support the GRR bill. And so you either lose in court and lose in the court of public opinion or you win in court and lose anyway. So the, it, it just seems like a crazy thing to pursue. I think that's absolutely, I mean, the, the, it's, kind of, it's unclear whether they, just how likely they are to win. You, and I mean, you've had um, Lord Hope at, at, or High Court judge who's said he doesn't think there's any chance that they will um, but I'd, equally, I've seen other legal opinion that it's it's pretty up in the air. It could be a 50-50 thing. Um, I mean, I think the the important thing to consider here, and the thing that this is a big part of the legal argument will come down to, is that Alistair Jack and the UK government don't need to prove beyond reasonable doubt, or even beyond on the balance of probability that this piece of legislation will interfere with. UK legislation, they only need to prove that they have a reasonable uh, concern that it might. So that, that sounds like a pretty low bar to me, and I think that's why a lot of lawyers feel that the Scottish government will be unsuccessful here, and 
yeah, I mean, Roddy Dunlop is very eminent um, KC, and he's, I'm sure, absolutely right that this potentially be years. It could cause millions of pounds, um, and it just really doesn't seem like the best way forward when even terms of use of itself, and uh, we don't really want to get in, as you said, to the detail of whether the policy is right or wrong but I think if you listen to the things that Hamza Yusuf said about the um, about some of the issues around the GRA team to accept in the leadership campaign that there are issues with this piece of legislation but he's now entirely focusing and his ministers are entirely focusing on the idea that not that they need to go to court because this policy is correct and so important but more they need to do it on a point of principle to show that they are not going to be pushed around by the UK government, which is fair enough. But if the, you know, if this really is a, an issue of the a, a sort of affront to democracy, then would the better thing to do not to be challenging the whole concept of having this section 35 in the legislation in the first place? That's legislation that the SNP and all parties signed up to, by the way. But you know, if they, if, if they really feel that this is unacceptable that the UK government can come in and kibosh Scottish legislation, would they not be better campaigning to have Section 35 abolished? Um, and equally, if the UK government is ultimately successful, does that not kind of show that their argument that this was an affront to democracy doesn't really stand up if, if a court finds ultimately that the problem was that this piece of Scottish legislation did interfere with UK legislation and that you therefore had two conflicting pieces of law operating across the same jurisdiction. So it's, yeah, it's good. It's very expensive, unpopular um, and very difficult to justify and uh, it seems like a, a crazy priority to have chosen when there's so many other things that you could be doing at the moment. And John, just the, the sort of political uh, angle to it, if he hadn't done this, the Greens would have probably walked out of the government, wouldn't they? I mean, they, they made clear that this was a sort of green line, if you want to put it for them, um, challenging the Section 35. So it's probably about keeping them on board as well. Yeah, I'd imagine, I imagine. I mean, the, one of the big questions is what does the legal advice that Hamza Yusuf has got from the, from the Lord Advocate, what exactly does it say? Because he had said during this campaign that he wouldn't go to court if the legal advice was telling him that he would lose. So, the, the, yeah, it seems like there's can only really be two things that are pushing him forward in this. It's pressure from the Greens and fear of this coalition falling apart if he doesn't do it. And also perhaps, you know, as we were talking about earlier, a kind of loyalty to his predecessor and a feeling that he's the honourable thing is to push forward on this because it was one of her big policy objectives. But it does, you do kind of feel that there would have been enough of an out, even with the the Greens, if he, if he had sat down with um, pa Patrick Harvey and London Slater and said, look, we've done everything we can in this, but we've got legal advice here that's telling us that we're going to waste a hell of a lot of public money if we, if we go to court and we're not likely to be successful. Sh surely that would have been enough to placate them. And if it hadn't been, you you know, perhaps got to question whether you can continue in that coalition. I just wonder if their out would be, say, if they lost the initial hearing um, and then maybe not appealing or taking it to the Supreme Court, so they could still say that they challenged it. Um, um, but it, the longer this process goes on, the closer the general election comes into view and I don't think the SNP really want this to be one of the, the dominant issues, Ben, in the general election. No, definitely not. I mean, it's electoral kryptonite, um, clearly. Um, they, they don't want this to be to be hanging on. I mean, as far as the Greens walking away goes, maybe I my view clearly doesn't match that of, of the SNP leadership, but you'd think getting rid of the Greens would be a bonus um, in electoral terms. Certainly, Kate Forbes, it, you know, it was very clear that had Kate Forbes won, the Greens would have walked away, and that didn't stop almost 50% of SNP members 
um, backing her. So at least half the party wants shot of the Greens. I would yeah. say the, the majority of SNP voters wouldn't bat an eyelid if um, Hamza Yusuf were to press ahead as a minority government for the remainder of the term. And, and and almost, you know, dare the Greens to to not back his budget. It's been shown that it can be done. Um, mm. Holyrood was was designed for minority government. Uh, uh, it baffles me why why the Butte House Agreement was is so important to them. Uh, but then I'm the you know I, I work for the Daily Express. I, I, I guess my view maybe isn't the same as 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 people who. Um, regard the, the partnership with the Greens as, as, as so vital. Jordan, just, just very briefly, I mean, Hamza Yusuf's got a pretty unenviable entry. You would imagine there's going to be more revelations about this police investigation dripping out over the next few weeks or months. Um, and now we have a potential by-election in, in Rutherglen and Hamilton West, which, if you look at the chronology, it could be in the summer. Um how much of a problem is that for the new First Minister? Yeah, I think it's a really big problem. Like Ben's right earlier, you know, they're, they're, they do they will not want to have have to fight that by election because there's a very good chance that Labour will win. I know the, the other thing that people are kind of theorising could happen is that perhaps at some point fairly soon Nicola Sturgeon might f decide that she doesn't particularly like sitting in the back benches at Holyrood and that could trigger an even more tantalising by-election than the south side of Glasgow, where an Sarwar could be um, competing for her seat. So it's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's an enormous problem for the SNP. They can see that their support is falling. One of the interesting things is that some of the polls we saw recently seem to suggest that while S SNP support is going down, actually support for independence overall is remaining more or less where it's been in the sort of high 40s and that suggests that there's the potential for a party to do quite well by having a slightly softer stance on independence um but labor seemed to have made clear that that's not going to be them um but i think either way you could you know the labor are going to pick up a lot of SNP votes and would in, in any violation now they're going to fancy themselves to to take a seat off the SNP and the equally it would just in every way it would just be a, a real disaster now for the SNP to start losing by-elections and for the party membership to think that things are on a slide and that they're you know they're, they're on a route to losing power so, We've already seen that there's a lot of SNP members leaving. It'll be interesting if we find out how many more have left over the last few weeks. And things are definitely not going well for them. I think you're probably the guy to ask that question, John, given that you broke the, the story on that. Um, just wrapping up, Ben, good week, bad week. Who have you got for us? Um, so, bad week. Um, Planet Hollywood was away for Easter last week. and. Um, uh, I feel like it's almost like a bad fortnight, so I'm going to go Peter Murrell. Um, I mean, just extraordinary scenes. I, I, I was also off for Easter last week, and um, I did feel for my Express colleagues on, on the Wednesday when the story broke and the police were searching uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Peter Murrell's house and, and raiding the, the SMP HQ. Obviously, it's a live case. We can't say too much, but I think by any stretch, it's been a bad week and a bad fortnight for Peter Murrell. Yeah, not um, not your best week. No, I don't think that's a controversial choice. Um, good week. I'm gonna I'm gonna again nail my colours to the Daily Express mast and say it's been a good week for King Charles the Third. Um, finally, the the will they won't they saga of of will. Um, Harry and Meghan come to the coronations finally over with something of a, a, a fudge. Harry's coming, Meghan's staying at home with the kids. Um, it, it's perhaps the best outcome for the royals. It, it, it's 
not a bad outcome for Charles. It means we can now focus on the event itself. Um, and I'm sure all Planet Holyrood uh, watchers will be looking forward to uh, a street party, uh, as I am, on uh, Saturday, May the 6th, to celebrate this momentous occasion. How about you, John? Who's in the doghouse? And who's had a good one? So I've, I've, the, the last time I was on Planet Holyrood, I said it had been a good week for Hamza Youssef. It was the week that he became First Minister. Um, and so I'm going to say it's probably been a bad week for him, given that um, sort of great, great start that he'd got off to uh, the last time we had this, this discussion um, since that then. That's new, uh, new junior ministerial team. Yeah. <laughs> Since the last time we spoke, the SMP by their own uh, president's words are now in the, the deepest crisis in the last 50 years. Their police have raided the, their offices and uh, Nicholas Lurgeon's home. Um, the membership numbers are going down. Their popularity seems to be falling. And I think the the dangerous thing for Hamza is, like we were speaking about earlier, he's, he really needs to develop a ruthless streak quickly and uh, distance himself from that old guard, get rid of some of the people that could be held responsible and set out a stall for a, a completely new SMP um, and vision for Scotland. Um, but rather than doing that, he seems to be remaining loyal to a lot of these people and pursuing some of the most unpopular policies of the, the previous FM. And I, I, it's difficult to see it going well for him. Um, in terms of who's had a good week, I was going to say J Jamie and Julie Hepburn, the, who seem to have become the SNP's new power couple after um, Julie Hepburn was given a, a high ranking job at Party HQ and Jamie was promoted to become an independence minister. But I think of what we know of that sort of SMP power couple dynamic, it might be a poison chalice and they, they would maybe think twice about putting themselves in that position. So instead, I'm going to go for Michael Mara, the Labour MS. He, um, he's had a big promotion this week. He's been made shadow finance minister. Um, he's like obviously a, a rising star in the in, in the Labour Party, um, and he's managed to achieve this despite something that's kind of got lost is that he was a, something of a Labour rebel on the GRR. He uh, decided not to vote, um, and. Yeah, he seems he's obviously he's it's not um his his stock with Hamza with um Anna Sarwar has not gone down as a result of that. He's a finance minister potentially, you know, if things keep on going well for Labour, could find himself in a fantastic position over the next few years. The rise of Mara. There we go. Okay, well, that, that's it for another week. I hope you've enjoyed what has become an SMP police investigation special. Um, thanks to Ben and to John for their analysis, and I hope you can join us again next week. Putting up to it, it's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.